we're having a conversation with Dr. John Lewis. He teaches at Duke University and he is a speaker for the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, Dr. Lewis, um, why is it that philosophy is important uh, to the economic issues that we are facing? Well, I, I believe that it is a mistake to think that economic calculations are judging most of the decisions that's, that are guiding most of the decisions that are being made today. If we listen to what our politicians say, they are making their decisions based upon claims to the common good or the national interest or some, some uh, reasons that allegedly um, uh, more important than economics. I think that if we don't understand the philosophy of capitalism, the philosophy of the free market, we'll not be able to understand why those decisions are being made. And we'll not be able to defend the free market and businessmen uh, as they pursue their values and create the goods we need to live. And is there something wrong with the common good and the collective interest? Oh, no, there's just something wrong with the way it is often understood today. We realize that when politicians talk of the common good, what they're usually speaking of is the interests of some men over others. What they'll say is that a certain business industry is making money, and they think, therefore, that they, the politicians, should have a right to redistribute that money to others uh, in the pursuit of a common good, which is a good, I guess, for everybody, but not for the businessmen themselves. The common good is usually used to justify redistribution of income from one group to another. And the politicians claim this, are able to make this claim, because they're presuming to speak for everyone. Uh, but the fact is that they're not speaking for everyone. They're speaking for narrow groups who want to impose their values on the rest of us. And these are moral issues. And these are moral or issues. philosophical issues. Well, these are moral issues. If we think, for example, that inequality is a moral evil and that everybody should have fundamentally approximately the same amount of wealth, then we will think that if one person gets rich and another person is not as rich, then they'll be morally right to take the money of the rich and give it to the poor person. Or in the United States, if we think that the purpose of banking is to make sure that poor people can buy houses, then we will pressure banks into making risky loans to poor people, uh, which is exactly what was done in the United States. Although uh, many people perceive capitalism as immoral or amoral. Amoral, that's right. Well, they do, but let's, let's consider what we mean by moral or immoral. Why is it immoral or not moral, amoral, to produce the wealth and the goods that we need to live a good life? If morality is supposed to allow us to achieve our happiness, which is what Ayn Rand thought, we needed a moral code in order to learn how to live well, then the capitalist who creates abundant and inexpensive goods is doing a great moral good to society. And the person who takes his wealth and redistributes it is the one who is immoral. But this depends on your, on your moral standards. By the moral standards of altruism, it would be right to take his wealth and his goods and give it to others. But by the moral standards of self-interest, it would be right to allow each person to pursue his own good and to keep that which he produces. And that's the fundamental moral conflict that we're facing today. And you have mentioned altruism. Yes. But many people want to be altruists. They want to be benevolent to others, good to others. But, al but being altruistic doesn't mean being benevolent. A self-interested person can be benevolent. He pursues his own self-interest, and he benevolent means originally to have goodwill. Beneficent meaning to do good deeds. He can be good to other people. What, what the altruist wants to do is to enforce, either by moral persuasion or by the actual force of the gun, to redistribute one person's wealth to another. And I don't think there's anything benevolent about that. If a student mm -hmm. uh, asks for your advice, yes. uh, how, can, how can I separate myself from these mainstream ideas that promote mm -hmm. altruism, right. that promote the morals of the collective? What would you advise? Well, first of all, you have to think about the issue, and you have to decide whether or not one would agree this way. Let's take the question of a student who comes to me for advice. Am I being self-interested or altruistic if I spend time with him and tutoring him? I think I'm being self-interested. It is my chosen career, my self-chosen career, to be an educator, to work with students, and to, and to assist them. Uh, just like a nurse who is working with patients. A nurse working with patients is not necessarily altruistic. That is her chosen career, and, and uh, she's being self-interested by pursuing that career. And uh, in, in, terms, in terms of uh, morals, again, yes. Mm -hmm. um, people tend to think that sacrificing oneself for the others is good. 
Well, why is it good to give up one's life for others? Let's remember what sacrifice originally meant. It's the blood doing, sacra blood. Plus, it's, it's, it's a, literally, it literally was t taking somebody up to the temple and ripping their living heart out. That's what sacrifice was. Sacrifice has become today an alleged ideal whereby you give up some value to other people with no return for yourself. If I give up a value to other people and I get a value in return, that's a trade. And by the morality of altruism and sacrifice, that has no moral status. It's only considered good if I give up a value and don't get anything back. But why? What kind of a society would it, would, would it be that valued and promoted giving up, each person having to give up his life to others? It would be a society of cannibals. And uh, speaking of what kind of society, yes. uh, we are living through times in which uh, society is changing, politics yes. is changing, and yes. uh, the whole system is, is, is changing. Um, do you foresee yeah. <laughs> uh, light in the tunnel, I mean, uh, in, in, in these conditions? Well, I'm not sure how much society and culture is actually changing. Certainly politics is, is, uh, seems to be up in the air a bit, but it seems like I don't think that things are changing that much. If you look at the politics in the United States, both the Democrats and the Republicans are demanding more and more sacrifices. John McCain wanted a nation of sacrifices. He wanted a service mentality, just like Obama. I don't think there's a fundamental difference between the two, except that Obama is overtly socialist, he's obviously socialist, and this allows people to actually you know, oppose him. But I don't think there's a fundamental difference between the two. I don't think that fundamental change will actually happen until the culture, until political discourse starts actually debating and arguing over these fundamental issues. But as long as it's two politicians, each of which claims national service, sacrifice, giving it to others is his primary then the arguments will only be about the amount and we won't have any fundamental change. Now politicians react to the prevalent ideas yes. uh, and react to what the voters want according to their right. philosophy, isn't yes. it? Well, I mean, you know, were the voters right to demand the death of Socrates? Were the voters right to elect Hitler? Just because the voters want something doesn't mean it right. The concept of individual rights meant to protect your rights as an individual from encroachment by all others, including the, including the majority. If you own your home and every other citizen in the, in the country voted to take your home from you, and if they can do it, then you have no rights. But under a nation of rights, the majority does not necessarily rule. Rights, and, uh, rights as in rights, not rights as, as in permission. Not as permission, but as individual rights. It is, it is my right to keep my property, and no one can take it from me. And uh, that idea has been lost today, rights, as you mentioned, as you suggest, and I'll stress, rights have become permissions today. It's as if the only thing we can do are the things which we are granted permission to do by the government. In the United States, you can't build a building without a building permit, a permit, a permission. You know, and that's, that's the opposite of individual rights. Mer people need, people in, in uh, every nation of the world need to come to understand what rights actually are. Their rights to act, to pursue your own happiness, to exercise your own liberty, and to keep your own property. By right, not by permission. Well, thank you very much for sharing these uh, ideas with us, and thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity.